Good evening, everyone. My name is Liz Degnan. I'm a librarian at the Middletown Township Public Library, and we are so excited to welcome Park Ranger Quinn Gilly from Sandy Hook National Park. He has been a ranger for about five years, and we are just thrilled that he's here to join us. Um, so take it away. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for being here. And I do want to thank the Middletown Township Public Library for inviting your National Park Service to come here and talk to you today. Uh, you know, when, when I was approached about doing this, uh, it was very an interesting subject to me. It was basically trying to find the historical connections between Sandy Hook and things that were happening there and Middletown Township and what was happening here. And this is basically a story that uh, spans over 300 years of history. So it's, this is a lot of history with a lot of absolutely fascinating things going on. And unfortunately we have about this much time to try to cover it all in today. But um, it, what I'm gonna do is basically kind of just explore this whole interaction between Sandy Hook and Middletown Township through small vignettes. We're kind of gonna take little peeks at that long history as we go through today. Uh, we're sort of going to do that by taking a little bit of a virtual visit to three places that are still standing, three locations on Sandy Hook today, and each one of them connects to Middletown's story. Um, but basically, what all happens here is you kind of have this tale of two communities going on between Sandy Hook and Middletown Township. Uh, they both make decisions and take actions back and forth throughout history that tend to have a big impact on each other. Uh, and that's what we're kind of unfolding into tonight here a little bit. So before we get into this and what this story reveals about the interaction between both places, uh, I do just wanna, again, welcome you to our Zoom conversation. One thing I'd like to ask you all to do, and it looks like you all are doing it already, is uh, just making sure that you, you've got yourself muted during the Zoom program. And again, if you have any questions or if you'd like to respond to any questions that I asked during the meeting, uh, please feel free to write that in the chat box. And Liz is gonna let me know if anybody has a question so we can go ahead and, and take care of that for you. But as we get into this uh, tale of two communities, I'd actually like to start by asking you all a question. What is the first word or thing that comes to your mind when you think about that word community? What does community mean to you? I'm going to go ahead and start a screen share here. Well, as you're all reflecting on that, um, basically, uh, one of the words that came up in my research that's kind of funny is the term stinking edifice. And I don't know if any of you are thinking about that in terms of community right now, but those were the words used by Royal Navy officer Ambrose Searle in 1776 to describe the smell of whale oil and unsanitary camp conditions of our first stop. There we go, sorry, the screen didn't want to turn there. Sandy Hook Lighthouse. So uh, I don't know, have any of you been here before? I imagine some folks have been to the Lighthouse. Uh, I was just there today myself. But the Sandy Hook Lighthouse, uh, to give you a little bit of background history on it, is old enough that it predates the United States. Uh, it was uh, constructed after the efforts of 43 New York merchants petitioned the New York Colonial Assembly to build the lighthouse on Sandy Hook. That's because they suffered a series of financial losses after a number of their ships wrecked on the shoals off of Sandy Hook. So they uh, were given permission to do this and through several lotteries, they gained the money to purchase four acres of what somebody said was barren Sandy soil from Robert and Essex Hartshorn on May 16th, 1762. And then between 1762 and 1764, the lighthouse was constructed and it was first lit on June 11th, 1764. Now, during the Revolutionary War, the lighthouse takes on a very new and very important strategic purpose, especially for the British, the Royal Navy. Uh, they realized very early on that it had a strategic importance to it. 
The British fleet enters New York Harbor carrying 25,000 troops on June 29, 1776. And they made absolutely certain that when they arrived, they first landed on Staten Island and Sandy Hook itself because they needed that lighthouse to guide their ships safely into the harbor. And uh, let me just pull up this map a little bit for you here. But if you can follow the, the arrow uh, on the screen, you can see that the only channel that was deep enough for ships to actually get into New York Harbor was right off of the northern tip of Sandy Hook. So any of the shoals out here would have meant the ships would wreck. So that's absolutely vital for an invading force to have this channel open and well marked to be able to get into Sandy Hook. Uh, Continental forces early on tried to disable the lighthouse. They were partially successful, but not so much that the British couldn't get the lighthouse back up and running very quickly after that. Uh, the British remained in control of the light throughout the war, which actually had very big implications for Middletown Township, especially if we look at it through the eyes of its African-American residents. It was not easy to be black in Monmouth County during the American Revolution. By the mid 1700s, Monmouth County's black population numbered somewhere roughly between 1200 and 1400 people. Uh, slavery was fairly well widespread in Monmouth County, though uh, most people in, in the county, they only, I think the, the most number of persons that one person owned was about six, not really any higher than that. Uh, but there were communities spread throughout the county, including Middletown. Between Middletown and Shrewsbury, the population of black persons there was about 20%. Uh, and, and those are enslaved people, though there are communities of free black people living there as well. And about two thirds of that black population were enslaved. Uh, now they, even the enslaved persons or those living free, actually fell under very intense suspicions from Middletown's white community as the war unfolded in 1775. Uh, they feared that black persons might agitate unrest in the community after picking up on a lot of the revolutionary rhetoric that's going on at that time period. Many of them lived very close to white families, so they would have been exposed to this and heard this. So what did these communities between Middletown and Shrewsbury decide to do from the fear of this? What happens is on October 6, 1775, a committee from Shrewsbury basically fills in the void that was left by a royal government that had collapsed in the area. And they take the opportunity to start coming out with new ordinances, uh, basically intended to control the black population that was there. One of the first ones that they passed on October 6, 1775 is quoted right here, uh, ordered whereas the numerous and riotous meeting of Negroes at unlicensed houses is pernicious in itself and may be of pernicious consequences, if the colonel of the militia is informed of any such meetings, he is desired to use his militia to secure the Negroes. Uh, so basically the aim was very strict control of the community's black residents. Um, by the end of 1776, after the United States has declared its independence, uh, black residents, again, enslaved and free, were prohibited from owning firearms. They were basically barred from serving in Patriot militias and they would be whipped if they were caught outside after dark. Uh, it was thought that any, they were meeting in secret and basically trying to foment insurrection. Um, now in 1776, we especially have a pretty bad uh, consequence here where two gentlemen named John and James Willings within the Milltown area assaulted and beat a free man, free black man named Caesar Moore. Uh, they were never charged with a crime after that which sometimes kind of harkens to some things that we've seen going on in our world today around us. But after all this happens, Sandy Hook's flickering light becomes a beacon of hope in the darkness for these people on November 7, 1775. This is when John Murray, the fourth Earl of Dunmore and Royal Governor of Virginia, moves his hand across a piece of paper, leaving his signature. Today, we know this as Lord Dunmore's proclamation. What he does is he decides that, and I'm quoting here, 
all indentured servants, Negroes or others appertaining to rebels, free that are able and willing to bear arms, they joining his majesty's troops. Now, this only applies to Virginia. And it's not really done out of any kind of moral responsibility. Uh, it's intended to harm slave owners in Virginia and the, the continental economy that's there. But word spreads throughout the colonies. And it's basically determined that if you reach British lines, you are free and no one can take that away from you. Now, Sir Henry Clinton actually made that true in 1779 when he applied it to all of the colonies. Uh, documentation is scarce, but after this happens, we actually have slaves. And this right here is a list of known enslaved persons who escaped slavery in Middletown. And I'll leave this here for a moment so you can look through this list. Uh, I point up top here, you see Aaron, Isaac, and Sarah Jones. It looks like the family is actually escaping together. Down at the bottom, I do want to point out Joseph Stewart, who escapes in 1783. He's 15 years old from a person named Crawford, uh, but he's actually going to come back into our story in a little bit. Uh, but what happens to a lot of these people, it's kind of hard to know what exactly happens. Many of them probably make their way to New York. That's where Joseph Stewart turns up. But a lot of them end up heading towards Sandy Hook. Uh, pardon me, I'm just going to start screen sharing for a moment here so you can see my face. There we go. So basically what happens, a lot of people head to Sandy Hook and the White House there because what is there at that time after the Revolutionary War starts and the British are there is uh, an encampment of what they called refugees at the time settles right at the base of the lighthouse. The British have fortified that lighthouse. They've set up a, a low stone wall, uh, cannons there and they have troops stationed there. But you have white loyalists from Middletown and the surrounding areas of Monmouth County heading there. You also have all the enslaved persons heading there as well to find shelter in the shadow of the lighthouse. Uh, but one thing I'd like you all to reflect on as, as we get into what happens to a lot of these people when they're there is to, to think about when has a community made a decision that in some way impacted your life and what did you do about it? What happens with a lot of the people who go to what they end up calling refugee town at the base of the Sandy Hook Lighthouse is many of them decide to fight back. And that's exactly what happens with many of the formerly enslaved people who fled there. Uh, one group formed there called the Black Pioneers, and they weren't necessarily a military organization, didn't necessarily take up arms, but they were serving as porters and laborers for the British Army while they were there. The numbers are pretty surprising of how many there were. That consisted by 1780, about 182 men, 74 women, and 73 children were living at the base of Sandy Hook and helping the British forces there. Now, one group that became pretty notorious in Monmouth County was called the Black Brigade, and they did take up arms. They were not an official unit of the British Army, but they basically would launch raids across the way into Monmouth County. Now, by 1783 at war's end, they numbered somewhere around 49 men, 23 women, and there were even six children with them. And what this group did was they, along with all of many of the other enslaved persons who were there and chose to fight back, carried the Revolutionary War from Sandy Hook into the streets and homes of Middletown Township. So go ahead and start sharing my screen again here. And it's kind of the carnage is revealed in, here we get, there we are. Part of the carnage that ends up from this is revealed in a lot of the newspaper stories from that time period. Uh, and I picked out a few of them just to kind of highlight this. This is a one report from the New Jersey Gazette in June 9th, 1780, talking about a raid in Middletown. It says, quote, Ty with his party of about 20 black and whites took and carried off prisoner Captain Barnes Smock and Gilbert Van Mater. At the same time, two of the artillery horses and two of Captain Smock's horses were likewise taken off. The above mentioned Ty's Negro and commands a motley crew with Sandy this tie was probably Titus. Uh, he was an enslaved, a young man, enslaved person who was owned by John Corleys who lived on Rumson. 
but he escaped not long after Lord Dunmore's proclamation in 1775. And it's a little mysterious. We don't know how he got there, but he ended up on Sandy Hook. And he ends up in charge of the Black Brigade and launches at least half a dozen raids into Monmouth County. Uh, one of them right here was into Middletown. Now, just a couple of days prior to this, and maybe some of you have heard this story locally of Joseph Murray, who's a farmer nearby uh, in Middletown Township, and he was also a member of the Monmouth Militia. On June 7, 1780, he was assigned to observe British movements near the base of Sandy Hook. Well, the next morning, he was actually attacked by three loyalists. Uh, they shot him to death. They shot him and bayoneted him, bayoneted him to death. Uh, it's thought that they may have actually been sent there by the Taylors, which would be Edward and his son, George Taylor, um, since they'd had some issues with him. They were loyalists living in Middletown Township. But George Taylor especially uh, was known for working with escaped African-Americans who were living on Sandy Hook. Uh, a few of his men had been caught in a skirmish in the years prior to that, and a number of them were formerly enslaved people. Uh, today, you can actually visit Joseph Murray's house. It is preserved by Forestry Park in Milltown Township. Now, this last article from the uh, New Jersey Gazette, dated April 30th, 1780, is particularly chilling to think about. Uh, this is during a raid in neighboring Shrewsbury, and quote, a party of Negroes and refugees from Sandy Hook landed at Shrewsbury in order to plunder. During the excursion, a Mr. John Russell, who attempted some resistance, was shot, killed, and his grandchild had five balls shot through him, but is yet living. So a grandchild was caught up in the carnage here. Uh, crops were burned in the nearby area, Cattle were often stolen. Homes were torn through and plundered. Uh, the Presbyterian Meeting House in Middletown was burned to the ground as well. So throughout the entire war, these raids took a toll on Middletown Township. And through the entire war, formerly enslaved Black people were also involved with these raids by that choice and decision to fight back over how they had been treated. Uh, because of their choice to fight back, at war's end, there really wasn't much choice for them. They couldn't necessarily return to Middletown Township. What they would have been facing very likely would have been a return to slavery or retaliation, uh, possibly execution. And they didn't necessarily fare much better with the British after the war either. Uh, during the war, many who had escaped to New York had actually been recaptured and sold back into slavery by loyalists who were in New York. Uh, but at war's end, Many of them, including 78 members of the Black Brigade, followed other loyalists to Nova Scotia where they resettled after the war. Uh, Joseph Stewart, we remember him from earlier. I actually found a record of him boarding a ship from New York and heading to Nova Scotia and settling there. So that's where many of them ended up, basically having to leave this area. And that included free people as well had to leave the area because of this interaction, these two choices that were made by both of these communities. Uh, stop sharing for just a moment. There we go. But basically what happens is these folks have to leave and we do still feel the impacts of this entire story and this interaction, the, these raids going back and forth between Sandy Hook at the time in Milltown Township. Now, many of these stories are talked about and celebrated in Milltown Township. Again, Joseph Murray's story is pretty well known. Also, the notorious Pearl Tie is very well known as well. Um, and we can visit them through the, by visiting the Murray Farm. Uh, but it's also still kind of lives on with us today, the, the impact of all of this and, and the legacy of it is Many times we are confronted by similar unrest in our communities today as well. Um, and we often see it in the news. When one group of people feels that they have been mistreated by another group of people or within a community by decisions that have been made. Um, we basically need to look no farther than what happened in the shadow of that flickering light across Sandy Hook Bay to remember what happened then and what the impact of this could be. Now, another one of the impacts that lasted from this was proof to the United States government that Sandy Hook was strategically important. And they took a very close look at trying to fortify Sandy Hook 
uh, in the years after the Revolutionary War. And that brings us to our next stop. Let's start my screen share again here. If the computer wants to cooperate with me. <laughs> Pardon me, folks. There we go. This brings us to our next stop and one that I love to talk about, the mortar battery. Uh, the mortar battery is an interesting structure on Sandy Hook today. It's actually right across the street from the lighthouse, which uh, I, we sometimes find a little humorous because we don't understand why a mortar battery, an artillery emplacement, was built right across the street from something so important as a lighthouse, one, one of the many mysteries at Sandy Hook. But it was constructed between 1890 and 1894. Um, and the mortar battery was constructed in a changing world. That's not so, you know, that, that probably sounds pretty familiar to us today. Our, our past couple of years, our whole world seemed to be changing too. But that was especially true in the 1890s uh, when the United States is basically has been very focused on looking outward, or pardon me, looking inward towards the interior of the country. Um, basically trying to deal with American Indians in the Western Ranges and trying to settle it. Well, in 1890, a lot of this changes. In 1890, uh, the US Census Bureau declares the frontier to be closed. American Indians have, despite our feelings on this, whether, you know, how we feel about this personally, but American Indians have been forced onto reservations. And now the military story out West deals with confining them to those reservations. But what happens is as the national eyes turn from inward to looking outward, things look a little scary across the ocean. So before the matter, the uh, mortar battery even existed on Sandy Hook, this is what we would have found there. During the Civil War, just prior to it, they started, the army started building a permanent fortification there, which you can see uh, in this photograph right here. And, and actually, one of the things I'd like to ask folks too, and you can feel free to unmute yourself right now and just call out, what is the first image or fort thing that comes to mind when somebody mentions a fort? A big wall. A big wall, right? Absolutely, a big wall, which you actually see under construction right here on the fort. Some other things that you would typically see would be these little squares that you see here are gun ports. So that's where cannons would have been stuck out and then shot or fired at ships as they're going along. Uh, the fort at Sandy Hook was also supposed to have another row of cannons across the top here and well over 100 guns. So this would have really been protecting New York Harbor, but that would have been against wooden sailing ships. In the 1870s, one of the things that we see when we look back out across the ocean, pardon me, would have been new military technologies, uh, including rifled artillery, which this photograph right here shows the effect of rifled artillery or a cannon that has had spiraling grooves cut on the inside of the bore to make the round spin as it was fired. That makes it go much further distance the shot is much more powerful. It's also extremely accurate. They developed these during the American Civil War. And right here, you are looking at damage done to Fort Pulaski in Georgia. Uh, it basically, what that rifled artillery does is turn the fort into dust. And now the real fearful thing coming from Europe is this new steel beast called a battleship. And these things are terrifying because they can carry that very heavily powered, very advanced artillery technology on the waves across the ocean. And the United States, which is now trying to establish itself as a player in world affairs, has to be able to deal with these things and defend itself. So what it does is it doesn't even bother finishing that fort at Sandy Hook. It designs the mortar battery as a new system of fortifications. And this is a, a great rarely seen aerial photo of the mortar battery, probably from right around the well, First World War era. But you can see how different it is. You see that big wall around the outside of it, but there are no cannons sticking out of it. The guns have been hidden deep inside in these four mortar pits. And within each mortar pit, there were four 12-inch mortars that looked like this. 
And uh, to give you an idea of the scale, you see down in the right corner here, the gentleman standing there in this mortar is maybe about three times taller than he is. This thing would lob a shell that weighed up to a thousand pounds straight up in the air, dropping it straight down on top of the battleship and the deck, punching deep down inside the ship, blowing it up and stopping it from entering New York Harbor. And since the guns were deep inside, they were well protected from any kind of enemy fire coming in. Now, what is the impact of this on Middletown Township? It seems obvious that it was intended to protect it, but it actually goes much deeper than that. See, at about that same time period and prior to that, throughout the 1800s, Middletown Township is a community of farmers. Uh, the whole economy here is based on a farm. Mostly potatoes were actually raised in Monmouth County, but they're also raising dairy, stock, chickens, eggs. Uh, that was the lifeblood of the township's economy at that time. And so they were relying on being able to get their produce to New York City's markets to keep their economy going. And that required transportation by water. How do they do that? With steamboats. Some of you may be familiar with the steamboat era here, but the steamboats were the key. Starting in 1819, that's when the first steamboat goes into operation in Monmouth, uh, yes, Monmouth County. Uh, it was called the Franklin and it actually landed uh, on, on docks along the Namasink River. But the, the steamboats remained in operation carrying this agricultural produce to New York City until the 1860s. That's when they begin shipping something else, people. And why are they shipping people? The beach. Same reason why a lot of people are coming to Sandy Hook in this area today. Uh, in the 1860s, a number of things are going on along with this changing world. Number one, uh, salt air being at the beach has been recognized at this time as having healing powers. It's good for the body. But also in places like New York City, you now have an emerging middle class coming onto the scene. Uh, these are People who basically, they now have more money to spend uh, because they've been able to invest in growing industries that are growing in New York City, but also they have more time to spend as well because with the Industrial Revolution, you don't have to sit there at home and make your own shirt anymore. You, you don't have to make all of your own soap and candles and things like that. You could just go and buy them. So what a lot of these people doing, especially upper class, is they start paying for passage on these steamboats across to places like Monmouth County, uh, one of the near shore areas for them to get to. And they're especially heading towards Long Branch. Now, Port Monmouth is kind of the key to the county at that time period, especially starting in 1860. It's because the Raritan and Delaware Bay Railroad constructed a massive 5,000 foot long pier and railroad terminal at Port Monmouth. So this was a hot spot for all of the steamboats coming out of New York City to basically drop off their passengers here. And then that railroad had direct service south to Eatontown and then to Long Branch, which is getting people from both Philadelphia and New York. It is a booming shore town that's growing there. So everyone's trying to get there. So everybody's basically coming right through Middletown Township and they're bringing their commerce, their money along with them. So you see some growth along the Bay Shore until this gentleman makes a decision. Perhaps you've seen him before, Abraham Lincoln. On July 21st, 1864, Abraham Lincoln grants a railroad right of way to the Long Branch and Seashore Railroad on Sandy Hook. This has massive implications. This railroad is basically able to come onto the military reservation uh, and they first head to Spermacetti Cove on Sandy Hook and they build a new steamboat pier and a railroad terminal with direct service down the Barrier Beach Islands. So we're talking about Seabright, Monmouth Beach, all the way south to Long Branch. Uh, a little, soon after, by about 1870, they actually had to move that pier a little bit further north on Sandy Hook. So if any of you have been to Horseshoe Cove, that's where that terminal was moved to. And the rail line was extended up there as well. You can kind of see that on this historic map right here. I'll circle the... Uh, steamboat pier that was here and then the tracks ran south. 
But this basically, this direct line to these growing sea resorts attracts all the attention from the steamship companies. And so a lot of these steam boats end up abandoning Port Monmouth for the steamboat pier and rail line at Sandy Hook. It takes a lot of that business and puts it over in that direction. Stop the sharing for a moment here. So basically what happens is you have some really incredible and pretty fierce competition that opens up between Sandy Hook and Port Monmouth. And Sandy Hook really ends up winning this competition because everybody, including steamboats that were built specifically to go to Port Monmouth, started going to Sandy Hook instead. Uh, and what happens is a lot of the development and commerce end up going just bypassing Middletown Township. Uh, so what does Middletown do? What decision do they make in response to this thing that has happened on Sandy Hook, which is now not been the best thing for them. Middletown Township decides to invest very heavily in railroads and starting building a direct rail line with service straight into New York City. So one of the first things that they do in 1889 is uh, they actually welcome and invite the Central Railroad of New Jersey to build a spur line from Matawan, which is a main station on their main line heading south, all the way over to Atlantic Highlands with stops at stations in Belford, Port Monmouth, all of these towns along the way there. So slowly, they're starting to reconnect themselves back to New York City. Uh, and that's not to say that the steamboats aren't still running down there from New York City, but they're not bringing the mass crowds from New York City that they had been before Sandy Hook had that terminal there. Uh, but have you all ever made a decision that you found out was actually not the best one for your in your interest? That's kind of what the army determines in 1892. And this ends up being really a keystone year for both Sandy Hook and what happens with this railroad and steamboat story in Mon or pardon me, Middletown Township. So let me pull up our screen share again here. Hopefully it wants to cooperate. There we go. May 30th, 1892, an important date to remember. This is when Atlantic Highlands seizes the opportunity. What has happened on Sandy Hook? The army, remember the mortar battery is being built right now in 1892. The army has found out that having a railroad pier and terminal there is not conducive to their new expanding defensive system that they're trying to build. That was not far away from the mortar battery. They want to secure Sandy Hook as a military reservation. So, so they so, 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 so. the railroad and the steamboat pier from Sandy Hook. It's kind of like a banishment. They told me hey, you have to leave, you cannot be here. Uh, that actually may have been in the railroad's best interest so they weren't too happy about it. Uh, one of the things, too, with the Sandy Hook Proving Ground, which is where they're testing a lot of this new high-tech artillery, they had an issue as they were creating more powerful guns where they would actually fire a shell and it would ricochet. And the, the bottom southern part of Sandy Hook is a very narrow little neck there, and that's the direction they were firing in. Uh, one same year that this happens, 1892, there was a bad incident where a 10 inch shell, which is a massive shell, this weighs over a thousand pounds, ricocheted off of what they called a sand bun. It was intended to stop it. Went out to sea, punched a hole through a three masted schooner, sinking it. The crew survived, but as you can imagine, they were not happy with the military over that. But that was one of the dangers that the rail line was facing from the military, the expanding military mission that was there. So what happens is Atlantic Highlands approaches the Central Railroad of New Jersey that has already built that spur line across from Matawan about building a brand new pier and railroad terminal that was there, which the railroad agrees to do. They construct this new massive 2,400 foot long steamboat pier. Uh, they also began work on a new bridge that was going to span across the Shrewsbury River. And sometimes you can actually see the, the uh, remains of this old bridge that was there. It was a drawbridge. 
Uh, but what it would do was it would carry this new rail line that had been extended all the way to Atlantic Highlands across and it connected to that Long Branch and Seashore line. So now Atlantic Highlands is directly connected by rail to those booming seaside resorts south along the barrier beaches. It is also directly connected to the steamboats coming in from New York. They are now the middle ground. They're catching all of the people coming in and they are also getting all of this commerce. So Atlantic Highlands experiences a boom in of itself. A lot of people coming in uh, and investing in it and building properties there. Now, I, I think one of the uh, funniest things that I came across it's a sarcastic comment, but at the time, at the grand opening of the new terminal, uh, several people, including the mayor of the town, spoke, but uh, United States District Attorney Henry S. White commented uh, with their thanks to what kind of commerce and opportunity this is going to bring. He said, the United States government merited the first thanks of our people for driving the railroad off Sandy Hook. Without that, we would have nothing. I think that's a little dire to say that they would have absolutely nothing. But it is something to think about because now Middletown Township that has invested in that railroad, which also had extensions a little bit further inland into the community, its web of railroad is directly woven into this line of travel from people from New York coming into Atlantic Highlands and down the shore. So what happens with Middletown Township? they also start to see more people coming into the township. Uh, basically what happens is with a lot of the people coming in, they're starting to notice as they come through Middletown Township, you have more people, especially people with a lot of money some of the wealthy from New York are coming through and they are noticing a lot of this old farmland in Middletown and they notice this would be a really good place for a summer cottage. So many people in the 1890s start building and buying land in Middletown Township, especially up around Middletown, and establishing cottages, summertime retreats for them to come across and rest. So they're coming across on the system now too. It makes it possible. Some of the steamboat companies would bill it as, you know, come across here to the Bay Shore of, of uh, Sandy Hook Bay, Middletown Township. It's a nice leisurely cruise across the bay on the steamboat and an easy trip along the railroad to get there. Now, uh, you can see, especially right here on this map, how well connected running from New York City, Jersey City, in that area down the rail line, but also the ferry line coming across and completely connecting Middletown Township. One of the communities you see pop up starting in 1895 is Butterwich. Uh, and, and this is just one of many that pops up. You still see actually vestiges of this community around us today. I think the clubhouse is still there. Uh, today it's called Monmouth Hills, but th this is one of the areas where all these people, wealthy elite are coming into. And one of the things that they also start investing in along with community are trolley lines that run local lines all over the place. And now as all these people are coming through, the reality going into the 1900s is that it is actually possible for you to live in Middletown and commute to New York City. So you start to see this buildup, this residential buildup in the area and people actually coming, staying in summers at first, but then over time starting to stay in the community. And the railroad continues to improve its service. So now after many of them are coming here, it's even more possible for them just to commute to New York City and live in Middletown. What happens basically from the decisions made by the army on Sandy Hook is that we very early on begin to see this shift of Middletown Township from a farming community to the more suburban community that we see today. And it's a little funny to think about, though this decision was not solely responsible, uh, pardon me, I'm gonna stop sharing a little for a moment. I don't wanna leave you with the impression that this decision was solely responsible for the residential buildup of Middletown Township. The railroads were heavily responsible for that too, but what happens is the decisions on Sandy Hook contribute to this very beginning stage of the shift over to suburban community. And it's kind of funny to think about a mortar battery as being the thing that helps 
make a community, bring the world a little bit closer to our community instead of keeping it away. Uh, and that connection to the world continues with us today. And we could see it as good or bad, it, you know, bringing the world a little bit closer brings good and bad things along with it. Uh, in 1917, the world was looking pretty bad. And that brings us to our fourth stop. Our screen share again here. A rather unassuming building that still stands on Sandy Hook today is the old YMCA building or the Young Men's Christian Association building. Uh, this one strikes me, I was, I'm kind of glad to be able to point it out to you because with Sandy Hook and a lot of people, especially coming up to the military post, Fort Hancock, which was established in 1895, um, it, a lot of these structures like this tend to get eclipsed by the military story. A lot of people want to see the gun batteries when they're coming out. Uh, but this building is a really good representation about how a bigger effort depends on structures that support it. And that's exactly what this was intended for. Uh, the YMCA building was built between 1901 and 1904. It was actually by presidential decree by Theodore Roosevelt of all people that allowed the YMCA to come onto military posts and build buildings there, uh, which he allowed in 1902. The YMCA constructed this building here to have a library in it, to have a letter writing room, it had a gymnasium. So many things to help soldiers be comfortable on what was a remote outpost at that time period. So this helps them, the more comfortable they are, uh, the better they're going to be, the more rested they'll be when any potential attack comes and then they can do their job. So the, this, it might not be as cool to talk about as the gun batteries that are there, but this is an incredibly important structure in the story of this place and the operation of it. It supported the mission there. That very much embodies the story of how Middletown Township also contributed to the mission of Middletown, or pardon, the mission of Fort Hancock on Sandy Hook during the First World War. Clouds of war were looming very heavily over Middletown, Sandy Hook in the late 1910s. The First World War had started in 1914 and during that entire time period, the United States was having debates nationally on what its role in the conflict should be. Should we get into the war? Should we completely stay out of it? Should we be involved in some small way? People were debating this, but public favor really kind of turned towards going to war in January of 1917. This is when something called the Zimmerman telegram is discovered by the British and then shared with the United States. Basically what happens is in this coded telegram, which was sent from Germany to its, uh, its ambassadors in Mexico was announcing that they wanted to make a proposal to Mexico that if the United States were to declare war on Germany, Germany would support Mexico in invading the United States and essentially reconquering all of the territory it had lost to the United States in wars previously. So what happens is on April 6, 1917, the United States declares war on Germany. The nation and all the talks in the nation, especially Middletown Township, turns to the patriotic and to preparedness. Uh, and Middletown Township certainly jumps right into preparing for war. Fort Hancock was very involved with that and in all the communities within the area. It regularly was sending officers from Fort Hancock into local communities to speak at preparedness meetings and also to assist local organizations like churches and schools drill their young men so they would be ready for enlisting ready for military service when the time came to go overseas. Uh, I actually found quite a few references to this in uh, records of the Red Bank Register, which actually you can go into an online archives offered by the Middletown Township Public Library and go through all of these newspapers yourself. But uh, I, one name that keeps coming up is Captain William R. Bettison. He was a coastal artillery officer from Fort Hancock. He had been there since about 1909. Uh, 
but he was the one selected to go out into these local communities and speak with everyone. Uh, one particular meeting at a Rumson schoolhouse, I love this quote, he urged the young men to take up the work of soldiery with an earnestness and a willingness to do hard work and do it when they were expected to do it because the time was coming very soon where they were going to be expected to go overseas and risk their life for their country and this new cause. Middletown was very much involved with that as well. In July, 1917, Middletown Township actually formed its own home guard for young men ages 15 and up. Um, they drilled every, I love this, they drilled every Thursday night from eight o'clock to nine o'clock PM. And they did it at the New Monmouth Baptist Church. They were led by veterans of the Spanish-American War of 1898 in that drill. Uh, so Middletown certainly expected its young men to take up that work. Now, meanwhile, Fort Hancock was also making its own preparations for war. In this historic photograph, you see one of the new defenses that they had built just prior to the First World War. This is Battery Kingman, a uh, high-powered rifled artillery piece that fired a 14-inch shell which is massive, that is a battleship killer. And it would fire this thing about 14 miles out to sea, and hit ships before they even came close to the harbor. So they're reinforcing themselves for the defensive mission of New York Harbor. They are also involved in a training mission. Yes, officers are going to the community to help train young men there, but they're also training new recruits at Fort Hancock from all over the country. Uh, one of them was the 57th Coast Artillery Company came out there. Here in this picture, you see them training on a 12 inch railroad mortar, similar to the mortar batter, what we saw there, but this one was actually towed on the rail line. These men were being trained for service overseas in France. Uh, now what happens is with this new mission here, you have an incredible buildup of soldiers and forces on the fort. So the garrison, the fort, fort Hancock itself was designed for 600 soldiers. That's who they had space for. By April of 1918, they had over 4,000 soldiers living on the post. That's a lot of people within this very small area trying to live with each other. And of course, you end up with certain growing pains when this happens. Uh, the fort's ability to care for all these men was very quickly overwhelmed. Uh, you had men who basically, they didn't have enough barrack space. They didn't have buildings for all these men. So many of them had to live outside in tents. Uh, which most of you living in this area, and especially if you spent time at Sandy Hook in the winter months, you know how harsh that weather can be. The wind just doesn't seem to want to stop blowing. Uh, Alfred Bricka, who is a, a soldier stationed here in 1917 and 1918, he actually mentioned that several times they had to be run into the barracks buildings because storms would blow through and tear up all of their tents. So they would have been, they would have been done if they had stayed in there. Uh, but another thing going on is you also have the YMC and gymnasium being overwhelmed. They don't have enough resources for these young men uh, basically to have any of the comfort of home there. It, I would love to know what these two are up to in this photograph right here. And it's some kind of small way of having fun while they're on this remote outpost. I don't know if they're sword fighting or playing air guitar right there. But what happens is the fort needs help. Now, who answers this call? Middletown Township. You see this group of young men right here. Look at those faces. Look how young they are. These are young men coming out here. This is the first time away from home. It is Middletown Township that comes, basically mobilizes to support the mission on Fort Hancock. And they do that in a number of ways, but the one that I wanna focus on with you tonight is what the women of Middletown Township did. On uh, the day after war is declared, April 7th, many women meet at the Majestic Theater in Atlantic Highlands, and they agree to form the Middletown Township branch of the American Red Cross. And they decide to take on a whole set of responsibilities and duties to help the soldiers on Fort Hancock with their mission. Uh, I, basically, one of the things that had been asked of them, Captain Bettison had asked women to do this as well in some of his speaking engagements, was to sew, make clothing, socks, and things like that for soldiers, uh, but also organizing parades, preparedness drives, raising funds for people as well. Now, this post included 
a lot of communities. It, it included uh, Port Monmouth, Atlantic Highlands, New Monmouth, Middletown, Bel Bedford, Bedford, pardon me, Belford, uh, Leonardo, Waterwich, and Navasink. All of these communities are coming together to support this mission. Uh, and these Red Cross workers did not miss a beat. They immediately mobilized. One of the first things they do is they buy thousands of yards of uh, burlap and sew them together into sandbags. I think they made about 2,548 sandbags to reinforce the fortifications on Sandy Hook. Uh, but they, they do quite a bit more than this. I'll start sharing my screen here again. They basically try to give these soldiers a little taste of home. In Christmas Day 1917, the Middletown Township chapter of the Red Cross organizes Christmas celebrations on the post. So they, they basically, they buy, put a, a Christmas tree right next to that YMCA building that we were working at. Uh, they, they put on entertainment. They have the post band come out and play Christmas carols. They actually project the words onto your screen so everyone can sing along. Uh, they decorate the buildings and the Christmas tree with colored electric lights. But one of the most amazing things was the women of this Red Cross chapter personally put together over 3,300 Christmas packages for the soldiers on the post. It had candy, handkerchiefs, games. Uh, Alfred Fricka finally remembered them having cigarettes in it. But they met their mission of having one package for every single soldier on the post so they can have a little bit of that comfort in the midst of this war and this incredible mission of trying to protect New York from any attack that might come at any moment. Now, they also collected fruits, jams, and jellies for soldiers in Fort Hancock's hospital. But one of the most touching things that these women did constantly was sewing bandages and surgical dressings for the army overseas and for use at Fort Hancock's hospital. Uh, it was endless, the amount of work that they put in, and the community really turned out to support them in this. Uh, women from the local high school would come out in the evenings and help sew many of these. The Red Cross organized it so they could hire a professional instructor in making surgical dressings, come out and teach all of these organizations and other Red Cross chapters in the area so they could do it properly. But uh, I, I, I would love to share this. I, I came across this quote from a gentleman named George W. Bristol, who lived in Atlantic Highlands and was walking past the Middletown Township's Red Cross headquarters in Atlantic Highlands one evening. Uh, and I just thought this was very touching. Looking back on it in 1919, he said, late that evening, we happened along First Avenue. There was only one building from which a light shone. It was the Red Cross rooms. And as we stood there on the sidewalk in the snow and the rain, we counted 57 women and girls making surgical dressings. There was no laughing or talking. Each one worked with a sober determination worthy that of a soldier in the trench. And as we stood there and watched them, we thought how in each pad there was wrapped a sweetheart's tear. And in each bandage there was rolled a mother's prayer. They knew where these bandages were going. And they knew what was probably happening to the poor men who they were going to be used on. But this was very personal for the women of this Red Cross chapter, as they were for all of them across the country. Uh, they, these were their people because Middletown's men and young men went overseas as well. They were serving there. But one of the things that they also end up doing as part of this is they organize drives and parades. And, and this one is very telling of how Middletown really turned out. Uh, between June 18th and 25th, 1917, the Red Middletown Township Red Cross pledged to raise $500, and they, and they pledged this to the National Office in Washington, D.C. In this time period, Middletown's residents raised $19,225 for the National Office. These were local people who turned out and gave this money to support this mission. And we even see libraries getting involved with this as well. Uh, these are two great articles I managed to find in the Red Bank, Red Bank Register uh, on April 18, 1917. The first one, the old Navasink Library 
used its rooms and allowed the Red Cross to come in and use the rooms to sew surgical dressings. They were using any vacant building that they could find, but the library welcomed them as well. Now, the one on the bottom, uh, and I love this, I'll, I'll read this quote to you here. The children of Middletown Village have collected more than 200 books for the soldiers and sailors. The work was under the supervision of Miss Mary Holmes Taylor, librarian of the Middletown Library. Something I would like to point out to all of you is in 1921, both of these libraries merged to become today's Middletown Township Public Library. So looking back, thank you Middletown Township Public Library for supporting this effort in the war. But both communities were making sacrifices to do this. So you see the Red Cross working very hard to support Fort Hancock and the general war effort. And I do like to point out there were sacrifices being made by both sides. Uh, and I think it's particularly helpful to put a face on the sacrifice that is being made. For example, right here, this young man was from Middletown, New Jersey, John F. Tierney. We all should remember these names so they're never forgotten. John F. Tierney, and look at his face, how young he is. He went off to serve, but he'd never even made it overseas. He actually died of pneumonia in October of 1918. They did notify his mother who actually sent this to the state archives. So her son's name would live forever and never be forgotten. This young man right here, Donald S. Rapp, another name to remember. He was from Fort Hancock, New Jersey. He had grown up on the coast. So he was from a military family. Now he actually died of the same thing of pneumonia, most likely from the Spanish influenza, was, which is what they called it, but it was the flu epidemic at that time period. Uh, it actually ravaged Middletown Township and Fort Hancock community. I believe Fort Hancock lost about 25 people to that. Um, and this gentleman would have been one of them. But others were killed in action overseas. And we do remember them today. Middletown Township has a beautiful monument still standing there. And I encourage you, please go visit this. Uh, but it just lists the name of young men from some of the local communities. Uh, but this is kind of where we still see the impact of this in our lives today around us. But we very much still feel the impact of this effort by the women of the Middletown Township Red Cross in our communities today. And today is particularly fitting to discuss this. Uh, the intense care and ceaseless efforts of Middletown's Red Cross women, along with 8 million other women across the country who volunteered with local Red Cross chapters, they helped push public support in favor of what millions of women have been fighting for for over a century. August 26 marks the anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, where women finally had a voice in government. What the Red Cross workers did was they actually pushed, helped push public favor in support of ratifying it. That included President Woodrow Wilson at the time. Uh, he had not, he had initially opposed allowing women to vote, but after the role of Red Cross workers and women who also worked in factories throughout the war, he changed his tune. He said, we have made partners of the women in this war. Shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil and not to a partnership of privilege? August 26, 1920, 19th Amendment is ratified. And so today in our communities, that's one way that we feel the impact of what these women did. So in part, this is the legacy of Middletown's legion of women who turned out to support Fort Hancock and its mission. Uh, but their legacy is also this. If you happen to notice a people making the same efforts for our community today, let it draw your mind back to that unassuming YMCA building that's sitting on an old military post, looked over, unrecognized, but silently helping everyone else survive. And that is where I'm going to conclude our, our brief little look through the interactions and the history between Sandy Hook and Middletown Township. 
There is an untold number of other stories that I wish I had time to share with you this evening. Uh, but these, especially the Red Cross women, really stand out to me to how interconnected these communities are. Number one, we're actually the same community. Sandy Hook is a part of Middletown Township. Uh, so it's, we, we are very much connected. We are one today. Uh, you saw that become very strong during the First World War, but today we are, which is why I'm here speaking with all of you to tell you about part of your community and share these stories here. Uh, but the story didn't end right there after the First World War. It continued. You have similar stories of Red Cross workers contributing to Fort Hancock's mission in World War II. Uh, you also have that same story of sacrifice being shared by both of these communities throughout the Cold War. On May 22nd, 1958, uh, there was a Nike missile battalion stationed down near Leonardo. And uh, a very bad accident happened there where, ten, where some of the missiles exploded unexpectedly. And seven, um, seven soldiers and three, I believe three civilian workers there were killed in the explosion. A small monument was put at the barracks building that was there at the time, but when the buildings were, when, when the Nike missile base there was decommissioned and the buildings were taken away, that small marker was actually picked up and now sits on Sandy Hook in Guardian Park so that everyone who goes to Sandy Hook today will never, never forget the sacrifices that Middletown Township made and its people made to defend the rest of the nation from some kind of danger. Uh, so our tale of two communities continues today, but I like to leave you thinking about, now you all are the ones who are writing it. So you get to decide, you get to make the decision now within these communities of what we do. Uh, and the community that we talk about today too is not just between Sandy Hook and Middletown Township. We're actually more now than ever part of a global community. I think Zoom, like we're speaking about, like how we're talking to each other right now really proves that. Uh, but since we're now becoming much more interconnected with the rest of the world, the decisions and actions that we take within our local community can affect people that we may never know. And so the legacy of this interaction between Sandy Hook and Middletown Township that I'd like to leave you all thinking about with tonight is when you make a decision in your community, you decide to make an action, just take some time on a dark night, if you can see it, and look across Sandy Hook Bay to that flickering light across the water, that lighthouse. And remember all the things, all the impacts that came from that light and ones that were sent out to that light from Middletown Township. And just think about what decisions do you wanna make and who do you think that they might impact and how do you want to impact them? So I thank you all very much. Thank you to the Middletown Township Public Library and thank you all for allowing your National Park Service to speak here today. Liz, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're speaking, but you're you're muted. Ah, I am muted, aren't I? <laughs> thank you. I was saying um, thank you so much. That was um that was so interesting. And I have so many questions, I don't even know where to start. So I think if it's okay, would it be okay to share your uh, information with the attendees? Would that be something we could do um, if we had any that, questions? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and, and actually one of the things that I can do is uh, in the chat box, I will put my government email address on there. So if any of you have any questions, please, please feel free to email me and reach out. Uh, because again, <laughs> there's so many more stories involved with this. And I know I always think of Sandy Hook um, I think of this um, recreational activities or what it first comes. And then when I go out there and I always see the history, I'm always like, oh my gosh, this is fascinating. Now the YMCA building, that's still standing? That is still standing there today. Okay, right, okay. And then, um, so I think that would be great. So everyone, uh, if you can see in the chat, you can see um, Quinn's contact information if you have any questions. Most of the comments were just all really super positive. Thank you, thank you, great presentation. So. Um, no. Well, thank you all very much. 
<laughs> so thank you again. This was really so inspirational, so informative, very thoughtfully put together, and we very much appreciate it. So um, with that being said, I'm going to, if anybody has any questions, last chance. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to end the presentation and thank you again so very much and we look forward to seeing you. Um, Ranger Quinn will be back in a couple of weeks uh, doing a story walk with our children so check the website. Oh, we do have a question. Oh, certainly. Uh, where is the statue of the World War One soldier? The statue of the World War One soldier, uh, goodness, actually, I'm, oh, I wish I wish I knew personally because it's terrible. but I have not had an opportunity to actually go there in person. Uh, so I don't know where exactly it's located. Okay, so Valerie, we are going to find out for you. Yeah. And Valerie, are... if, you, if you want to send me an email, I will find that location for you. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a good tip. So thank you. Any other questions before we wrap this up? Again, thank you all for attending. Thank you so much. And check our calendar because he's coming back in a few weeks. So... Thank you again. <laughs> Take care. You too. Thank you all very much. Oh, 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 wait. We have another Absolutely. question. <laughs> Which building is the former YMCA building? That building, uh, I'm trying to describe it. So if, if you're familiar with Sandy Hook, it's actually just, it's within eyesight of the lighthouse that's there. Uh, so the building next to, if you, you go along the, a lot of the old barracks buildings that are there, the YMCA building is sort of on the court. Yeah, actually, it might be easier to say, look for McFly's, which is a, uh, <laughs> it's, a it's a, a new deli, sort of like a cafe right next to the lighthouse. And it's right around the corner from there. So you'll, you'll know it because on the side where the old gym was, the, the gymnasium part was torn down, but it's hysterical. There are big letters on the side of the building that say no ball playing. And we have displayed in front of it an image of soldiers during World War II playing ball against the wall of that building. That's funny. Well, actually you can walk around the whole, I mean, just walking through or biking through, you see all the old buildings. It's just, it's fascinating. You could spend like days out there. There's so much to see and- Yes, absolutely. There's a lot to discover out there. And I do invite all of you to, to please come out and visit all of us at Sandy Hook. We'd love to see you. I'd love to tell you more, more of your stories and your history. Uh, because again, it is a national park, so you all own it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and feel free to, again, reach out to me by email. You can also call the Parks Visitors Center. Uh, typically on weekends, we have rangers stationed outside of the lighthouse. You can stop by. We've got maps and information for you. All right, that's great. I think that's it. All right, awesome. Thank you all so much again. Have a fantastic evening. Stay cool. Yes. <laughs> all right, I'm going to end the session now. <laughs>